the greatest sermon that was ever preached on this planet earth is the Sermon on the Mount. And it was preached by none other than Jesus, our Lord and Savior. If you have your Bibles, you will see that most of Matthew 5, 6 and 7 is in red letters, isn't it? And uh, one of the things that people loved about the teaching of Jesus was he touched the hearts of the people. Not everything that he taught was appreciated. We are living in times where people want to listen to prosperity gospel. Jesus never taught prosperity gospel. He taught the truth whether people liked it or not. Sermon on the Mount was not accepted by everybody easily, those who sat there, because there are certain teachings there that people didn't want to follow. You know, sometimes, especially students of the God's Word, and some of us have some doubts about scriptures. And we don't understand when we try to scratch our heads and why it is. Once there's a person who said, Mark Twain, once again, he said, I have no problem with those parts of the Bible that I don't understand. But it's those parts of the Bible that I do understand that I have a problem with, he says. Sometimes we wonder, where did Cain wives come from? Where did this happen? Where did that happen? People are breaking their heads. Mark Twain says, that's none of our business. What is clearly revealed? What do you do with that? Instead of worrying about what you don't understand, what you understand, what do we do, what do, we do about it? That's, that's very important. Sermon on the Mount. Uh, for example, John, sorry, Luke 3, 11. There are so many teachings in the Bible that we hardly follow. He answered and said to them, He who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. What does that mean? Anybody did this? You only have two shirts. According to John's teaching, if you want to follow Christ, if you see somebody who doesn't have a shirt, how much of what you have should be given? One of it, isn't it? John is very reasonable. He's not saying remove your shirt and give and you go naked. He's saying if you have two, isn't it? If you have two tunics, give one. Anyone did it? Can we do it? You know what I've done? I prayed for them. I didn't give them. I prayed for them. Such an easy, convenient way of doing, isn't it? Lord, bless them that they may have. You see how Christianity, we don't practice what the scriptures teach us. What about Jesus' teaching? You know, Bible speaks about birthday celebrations and anniversaries. There's a way that we are supposed to celebrate. In the Bible, there are only two birthdays that's been celebrated. Birthday celebration is not there in the Bible, but two people celebrated. One in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament. Who did it in the Old Testament? He celebrated his birthday and something happened. No? Who did in the New Testament? You're not sure? We have baptisms. You all need to be baptized again. <laughs> okay, that's for you to answer. Give it to me later. Okay, but Bible actually tells, Bible is not against celebrations, but it gives us a formula how to celebrate special days. Look at Jesus, what he said. What did he say? Luke 14, 12 to 14. Luke 14, 12 to 14. He says, when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind. Who do you invite? The poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind. And you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you shall be blessed, repaid at the resurrection of the just. Anybody did this? You had your birthday, your son's birthday, your daughter's birthday, or your anniversary. Did you, did you do this? Jesus is saying when you do celebrate your special days, don't invite your friends, your neighbors, your family. Invite the poor, the maimed, the lead, the dim, the deaf, and feed them. Anybody did it? I didn't do it. You see how difficult it is to practice the teachings of Jesus? Now coming to the Jesus teachings, we have seen Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 onwards. 
You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, not to resist an evil person. Whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. Jews were taught tooth for a tooth, eye for an eye, tit for tat. That's what we call, isn't it? But Jesus is saying, but I come to tell you, do not resist who? An evil person. Do not resist an evil person. And then it says, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. Anyone did this? If somebody come and slapped you, you said, here is my other cheek. Can you hit me there as well, please? Have you seen any faithful Christian Seventh-day Adventist do that? Do you want to try it on me and see if I will turn the other cheek? You want to try? You think I'll turn? How hard, isn't it? How hard? If somebody says a word that you don't like, we become furious. Jesus is saying this. And then next he says, if anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. What does that mean? Can you imagine? Suing means they dragged you to a court, demanded that you give them your shirt. And what is the, Jesus saying? If they drag you to a court, ask you to give your shirt, give him your trouser also. Does it make sense? First of all, how dare you drag me to a court? And then I have to do what, more than what you demand from me? When the Jews were listening to this Sermon on the Mount, not everybody were happy. They hated. But there comes another verse which they hated to the topmost. It's in verse, verse 41. And whoever requests you to go one mile, go with him too. Did I read right? I'm reading again. Whoever requests you to go one mile, go with him too. Did I read right? No? What did I do wrong? Huh? Please speak. In whoever compels you, the scripture says, isn't it? And I said what? Whoever requests you. There's a vast difference between requesting and compelling. Look at what Jesus is saying. Whoever compels you. You know what compels means? Forces you, drags you, makes you do things that you don't want to do. How long? How they, they're compelling you to go one mile. If they ask you to do it, go how many miles? Two. How many of you would love to be compelled to do things? We are in a generation where even request is not working. Isn't it? You know, I, I, my children, I have to plead with them. Please, please. And still I have to struggle. And if you try to force, the whole heaven will fall down. Who would love to be forced to do things? At Jesus is saying, whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him two miles. You know what that means? During the time of Jesus, they were, the Jews were ruled by the Romans. Isn't it? Wherever the Romans went, they put their stamp of authority by introducing certain laws. There is a law called one mile rule, which means a Roman citizen who occupied your land has a right to compel you to carry their baggage for one mile. I want you to understand the background. Here are the Jews in their own land, but they are captured, occupied by the Romans who are ruling over them. And one of the Roman rule, or what we call Roman yoke, is they have a right to compel the locals to carry their baggage or whatever they want you to carry for one mile. If you refuse, two ways of punishments, 30 lashes on your back there and then, or one day imprisonment. So, Jews hated this law so much so that from the doorpost of their home, they counted 5,200 steps which comes to one mile and they carried the luggage not one step further. Because they hated, how can somebody, an enemy, occupy my land 
and then make me, compel me to do. They hated the Romans for this Roman yoke of one mile rule. Now here comes Jesus, whom they are so pleased, he seems to be their savior, trying to elevate them from their troubles. They are thinking that he is the one who is going to deliver them from the Romans yoke, comes to teach them and say to them what? Whoever compels you to go one mile, you go how many? Two miles. You think they like it? The first mile itself is inconvenient, illogical. They don't want to do it. And yet here comes Jesus telling them, whoever compels you to go one mile, go two miles. How unreasonable is that one? Is he for us or is he supporting the Romans? Romans are better because they only force you to do one mile. But this teacher asking me to go two miles, is he mad? Is he for us or against us? They hated this law so much. So, moreover, it was not request, please help me, I'm struggling to carry. No, compulsion. You are forced. For example, the soldiers that ask you to carry, you think they are kind-hearted? They are rude people. How can you help a rude person who compels you to do things? Moreover, the luggage they carry, you think it's a kg or a two kg? The historians say they carry not less than 20 kg at a time, whatever the backpack they have. So imagine carrying a backpack of 20 kg weight for one mile. You know, one mile is more than your kilometer. And then Jesus, if you want to follow the teaching of Jesus, you have to walk two miles. 20 kg pack back. It's not. What if you're busy? You're on your way to office, your work, and then here comes the Roman soldier and he says, hey, MK, come here, pick up my bag and walk. Can you say, sir, I'm already late for my work. Can you excuse me today? I will do it tomorrow. There were no human rights. You can't take him to court. You can't fight your case. Punishment is immediate. Take 30 lashes or go out into the prison for a day. Either you take the bag for a mile or go in the prison for a day. No matter in what way you see, this one mile Roman rule is inconvenient and it is not acceptable. And moreover, who is the one who is asking you to carry your bag? His bag? He's not your friend, not your family member. He is the enemy who occupied your land, eating up your resources. How can you do that? And here is Jesus saying, walk two miles. Does it make sense? No. What if you're on your way to work? Can you make an excuse? No. What if you're going on the opposite direction? Here comes the Roman soldier and he wants you to carry his bag this way, but you're going the other way. Can you tell him, sir, I'm sorry, that's not the way I'm going, I'm going this way. If you want me to carry your bag, I don't mind walking this way. Do you think you can say that? No. You have to stop, carry his bag one mile and then walk back another mile to come to the present place, isn't it? And then carry on your journey. If you were to follow the teaching of Jesus, walk two miles, walk back another two miles, which is four miles. What is this? What if you're carrying your own bag? And here comes the Roman soldier and tells you, hey, Mohan, come here, pick up my bag and walk. No request, compulsion. You have two options. Either you carry both the bags or leave your bag and carry his bag. Isn't it? You leave your bag here. Can you say, can I go home, put my bag in the house and come back? No. And if you have to follow the teaching of Jesus, go two miles, come back, four miles, who knows what happens to your bag. It doesn't work like that. The law is inconvenient. It is unreasonable. What if it was a Sabbath day that you're going to church? Where do where does Jews go on a Sabbath day? Where do they go? To a synagogue, isn't it? They go to a, like a church. You know, on a Sabbath day, there are certain things that they are not supposed to do. There are a list of 39 things that they are not supposed to do. Let's somebody read for me John 5:10. John 5:10. You know what it says? 
there was a man that was carrying his bed on a Sabbath day. You remember? The Pharisees come to him and they say to him, what? It is not lawful for you to carry your bed on a Sabbath day. That means one of the things that the Jews were prohibited from doing on a Sabbath day is not to carry anything. They don't carry anything on a Sabbath because carrying anything is considered as a work and violation of Sabbath. So what if it was a Sabbath day, you're going to the church and here comes the Roman soldier and he tells you, hey, come here, pick up my bag and walk. What is it, what is it considered as? Breaking of Sabbath. So what is Jesus trying to say? On top of that, you know how long a Jew can walk on a Sabbath? There is a certain distance that he has to walk. Beyond that, if he walks, he's breaking the Sabbath. Acts chapter 1 verse 12. Look what it says. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. Are you with me? The distance between Mount of Olives and the temple Jerusalem. Has anyone been to Jerusalem? No. I've been there. You know, this is Mount of Olives. As you climb down the mountain, you climb the another mountain, Mount Zion, that's where the temple of is. So the distance between these two mountains is one mile. The middle, the valley is called Kidron Valley. Have you heard of Kidron Valley? Yeah. Mount of Olives, Kidron Valley, and there's Mount Zion where the temple is. The distance is only one mile. So for a Jew, on a Sabbath day, the distance of one mile in the Sabbath day is called what? A Sabbath day's journey. That means, Every Jew is supposed to walk only one mile on a Sabbath. That also for what? For your worship service. You go anywhere in the world today, a practicing Jew will have his house within one mile radius from the synagogue. They don't even drive the car because if you have to drive the car, that is work. Why? You're pressing the pedal, you're burning the fuel, that is work. So you have to walk. If you're a practicing Jew, so if this law, if you were to follow Jesus' principle of walking the second mile, what happens to Sabbath? Number one, by carrying, you're breaking the Sabbath. By walking more than a mile, you're breaking the Sabbath. Is this Jesus for us or against us? No matter in what way you see, this law is unreasonable and not acceptable. And Jesus is saying, if somebody compels you it doesn't say your friend, your mother, your father, your pastor, your teacher, whoever, which means it could be your enemy. In the case of the context, it was the enemy who is forcing you, isn't it? Whoever compels you to go one mile, go with them two miles. I'm sure on that day, when people heard this teaching, some of them could have got up and walked away and said, you know what, this guy is mad. I'm not listening to him. How dare he tell me to walk two miles with my enemy. Who knows? And yet, Jesus, if Jesus taught it, it means there is something in it, isn't it? That is for us to understand. By the way, is there a practice of this one mile rule in the Bible? Turn with me to Matthew 27. Matthew 27. Verse 32. You remember? When Jesus was carrying his cross, he was tired, he's not able to, something happens. Verse 32, Matthew 27, verse 32. Now, as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene by the name of Simon. And what does the scripture say? Next part. Him they, anybody? Him they compelled to bear his cross. So while Jesus was carrying the cross, He's not able to carry. He's tired. And what did the Roman soldiers do? Did they come to you and say, my friend, can you please help your friend? He's struggling. The scripture says, they saw a man standing next by by the name of Simon. They dragged him. The scripture says, they dragged him, put the cross on him and said, carry. Because it's a law. The one mile is a law. You have to. So Simon has no option but to carry. Don't think because he loved the Lord, he carried the cross. That was a law there. So you see, it was there in the practice. 
So in whatever way you see, this doesn't make sense. And yet, Jesus taught, whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him two miles. I will tell you five benefits of walking that second mile. The first one, it's a great tool for witnessing. Do you know who are the enemies of Christianity today? Christians. The world is not, the world is not able to see Christ through the eyes of a Christian. We are our own enemies, not Hindus, Muslims, atheists. If we lived up to the light that God has given us, Christ could have come long back. Why do I say this? For example, let's take the example like this. Two people on that mount where Jesus uh, was teaching the Sermon on the Mount heard this message. One is a first miler. The second one is a second miler. Then the first miler and the, so they, they went to their home. The next day, they go for work. Here is a first miler. I don't like his teaching. He's not for us. He's supporting the Romans. He's not happy with the sermon. He went to work in his field. He took a sickle or you no know, to cut weeds or whatever. Then on the road next by is the Roman soldier coming. And he comes and says, hey, Mohan, come here. You're working in the field, your own field. Come here, pick up my bag and walk. Who are you? You're a first miler. You hate this law. You hate the Romans. They are your enemies. They occupied your land. How dare they make you walk? Force you. But you have no choice. So you come with so much of anger and frustration. You give him a frown, look, take his bag, put on your bag. How many steps you start counting? 5,280. And do you think you're, you're, you're talking to that man? No. I wish I was strong enough. I could have punched him or killed him. That's the kind of emotions you go through because you hated this law. You go to that 5,280th step, you drop his bag, give him a strong, angry look and walk back. You hate. So you come back to your place, then pick up your sickle, start cutting. You know, have you tried doing things when you're angry? You start cutting, you know, I, I have so many instances. One day I went, I, I was a bit late to church and I, sometimes I don't know where I keep my things. And I told my wife's name is Rosie. I said, Rosie, where's my glasses? How many times I, I keep here and they disappear? And all, I was getting angry and mad and she started smiling at me. When you're angry and if your wife smiles, that, I don't like it. I said, what's wrong? Why are you smiling? She said, you're already wearing them. The point I'm trying to say is when you're angry and try to do things, you don't think straight, isn't it? So this guy goes there, goes back, hating that Roman soldier, and he's trying to cut. And his fellow who's working next to him says, hey, Mohan, what's wrong with you? Instead of weeding out the weeds, you're cutting the wheat. That's what happens in an angry, upset, you do certain things, everything goes wrong. He says, no, I don't like this. That man upset me today. I'm not going to work today. He goes home. And the wife comes and the wife listens. Hey, you came home early today. What has happened? What's your problem? Leave me alone. Then the children come and they say, daddy, so glad to see you at home alone. Leave me alone. That's how the first miler behaves. It's all about him. It's all about his. There's the other person who heard the teaching of Jesus. You know what? I don't like this law. I don't know, but somehow I believe if this man said it, there is some truth in it. Let me practice and see if it makes any sense. So he goes to work, the same scenario, takes his sickle, trying to weed out the weeds. Here comes a Roman soldier who says, hey, come here, pick up my bag and walk. He's keeping himself calm. He doesn't want to get angry. He wants to try this second rule, how it works. So with a gentle calmness of spirit, he says, he walks out of his field, goes to the Roman soldier, and he says, good morning, sir. Huh? I think this, boy, this man's brain has gone wrong. Because nobody wishes them good morning. He says, what can I do for you, sir? Carry my bag. Okay, sir. Put on your bag. Keep walking. And while walking, you hum some songs. Some songs, some kind of peace song. Roses of Sharon or whatever, whatever. What do you think the Roman soldier is looking at you and thinking? This guy's chip has gone definitely. If you're in your right mind, you don't do those things because nobody does those things. And you keep walking. 5,280th step. And the Roman soldier was expecting you 
to drop the bag and go back. Instead, you kept walking. And the Roman soldier is definitely something is wrong with his brain. Hey man, did you not realize that you finished one mile? And you say, yes sir, I know I finished my one mile, but I would love to walk another mile with you. What? Are you crazy? Which foolish man told you to do such stupid thing? I'm a Christian sir. My Jesus, who died for me, told me, whoever compels you to go with you one mile, go with them two miles. I'll be glad to walk with you for another mile, sir. Who? Jesus. Who is he? The savior of the world. Are you seeing my point? You walk that second mile. And in the second mile, you say, you know what? I heard Rome is a good place. There's so big roads, wide roads, amphitheaters. And, it, and what do you think the Roman soldier is? If you boast about your country, what will you think? If you ask me, Pastor, we heard India is good, what will you say? No matter how bad it is, I'll tell you good. If somebody says, I heard Zimbabwe is a beautiful place, you start boasting, telling all the lies. Because we are proud of who we are. So here is a Jew asking, tell me about your country, Rome. And he'll be glad to say. And the second mile is come. You're sweating. You're tired. But there is no anger on your face. There is gentleness on your face. And then you say, sir, it was nice talking to you. It was nice carrying your bag. You drop it and you say, God bless you. And you go back. What have you done? You have left an everlasting impression on that crude, cruel Roman soldier. How can this man walk two miles with a smile on his face saying that some weird guy called Jesus asked him to do it? There must be power in that guy who told him to do this. You know what Acts 4, 12 says? In the name of Jesus, there is salvation. All that sometimes people have to hear is the name Jesus. And in that name is power and life and salvation. Who knows, the spirit of the Lord keeps working in his life. And someday, he will become a Christian because he has seen the demonstration of a follower of Christ. He never read the Bible, but he saw the Bible in you. And on the day of Jesus' second coming, if you and that soldier are in heaven, that soldier would come to you and say, MK, that second mile changed my life. I'm here because of what you did. Today, we are such a selfish bunch of people. In the name of Jesus, we do all sorts of things. Even to walk the first mile is so inconvenient for us. You think I'm telling a lie? I'm including myself too. That's why I said the greatest enemy to Christianity is you and me. The world is yet to see how a Christian looks like. The closer you come to a Christian, the more wretched you feel about it, isn't it? Oh, behind the pulpit, look! But when I go closer, is this who he is? Lord, have mercy on us. That's why Jesus said, whoever compels you to go one mile, go with what? Two miles. If each one of us would have walked that second mile, Christ could have come long back. Because that's where your true identity of a Christian is. Not in the first mile. The first mile is a law mile. L-A-W. But the second mile is love mile. The first mile is mandated mile. But the second mile is your opportunity to reveal who you are. For the first mile, you are a slave to a Roman. But when the second mile, you are a servant of the Most High God. And yet, we don't. How dare you even tell me to walk that first mile? If all of you walk that second mile in the college, the staff, everybody walk that second mile, solution will not be the same as it is now. No point of praying when you are not willing to change yourself. You want God to bless this institution? Walk the second mile. So the first blessing I leave you is a great tool to witness. In your workplace, in everywhere, let people see you as a second miler.
The second benefit of walking the second mile, it's a great means to succeed in life. It's a great means of what? Succeed in life. <clears throat> Once there was a mechanic, car mechanic. Everybody goes to him. You know why? I go there. I'm just telling an example. If you ask him to change the engine oil, this guy changes engine oil. He, takes, he, he tests the pressure of your tires. He tests your brakes. He tests everything and then says, all is good, go. But he only charges you for engine oil. Next time you have a problem, who do you go to? Why? You asked him to do one, but he made sure that everything is all right. Even if he stays 10 miles away from you, you will still drive to go to him because you know you get the best service. I read a story about a young man. When he was young, his mother taught him, and then some. Just a phrase, and then some. He became a millionaire at the age of 39. He retired. The whole city called him and said, how can you at 39? They gave him facilitation and they said, how can you at the age of 39 become a millionaire and then retire? What's the secret of your success? And he says, and then some. What? What do you mean by and then some? Then he says, when I was a kid, I was taught in the school, whatever the your teacher told you to do, do it and then some. And I got higher grades. When I went to the university, whatever I was taught, I did, and then some. I got higher grades. I graduated with the greatest honors, and I applied for a job in different companies. Looking at my resume, so many companies, uh, companies wanted to employ me. I chose the best. When I went there, I still followed the same principle. What is the principle? And then some. If the office hours is nine to five, what does and then some tell you? You go early and you leave late. Give more than what you are required to give. That's what is and then some. In two years time, my boss saw my hard work and he promoted me to be a manager. And in five years, I started my own company. I employed people and I treated them with the same thing. Not only I gave them the salary that is required and then some. So they gave me more work than what I required from them. I have enough now, so I sit down. If I were to ask you that question, I can see so many guilty faces. We go to office late. If the boss is not around, you watch on your phone. When he's coming, that's when you try to do as if you're pretending. And you're always looking at the watch to get away a bit early. Some of us are poor. And who is to be blamed? You. Because you're not faithful. You're not genuine. Why God doesn't bless us? Because we don't work hard. We don't even want to walk that first mile properly. Forget about the second mile. And you're praying morning and evening, Lord bless me. How dare you pray for God's blessing when you're so lazy? Excuse me for my language, but I'm sharing it with a burden. None of you are my enemies. I want to see that we all are better people as God's people. Work is like worship. You're accountable for every minute that you're employed for. You may blind my eyes as your employer, but God is watching. Every Christian is demand, commanded to give more than the best you can give. If every staff in this place, every administrator, every one of you give more than the best you could give, this university will prosper. But some of us are selfish. It's all about what I want, how I want. I'm not just talking about solution. It's the same everywhere. Because we are not second mile Christians. The first mile we even struggle. What about students? If tomorrow is exam, Today, quickly go through some things and scrape them. How can you be a successful person? If you're not disciplined to work hard and do more than what you are. You heard of the story of Ben Carson, isn't it? He was called a dummy in the class. His mother gave him a simple principle. Read two books out of, outside your homework and teach, tell me what you read. You must watch that movie, Gifted Hands. It's on YouTube. Free. 
the guy's life transformed. World renowned neurosurgeon because he chose to walk the second mile. He's a black man. Nothing is impossible. I told you from day one that you are a dynamite. So much potential. Not even one person we use it. This Ben Carson said, no, nobody on this planet Earth so far have used at least 10% of their brain. That much capacity is there. Not even 10% anybody used so far. Because we are lazy. We are satisfied. Somebody in the United Kingdom, USA is sending some money. You sit here and eat and enjoy. I was here last year in Bulawayo. And I've met some people of such nature. You bring up, auntie, can you send some money? I don't have fuel for my car. Sorry for being rude, but that's what the reality I have seen. If you want to be successful, walk the second mile. Work hard in your studies more than what you're expected. You will shine. You will be a very special, unique person. Don't settle for less. When you settle for less, you go nowhere. Don't look for just pass mark. Look for excellency, because that's where your success lies. Your students, and I'm challenging you, work hard, more than what you're expected. And you see, in a year or so, nobody can compete with you. That's the potential God put in you. So it's a road to success. The third blessing, it's a great source of blessing, the third benefit. Those who walk the second mile, they are the most blessed people. Let me illustrate with, by the picture, can you tell me what story that is? Anyone? Huh? Thank you, thank you, that's true. Turn with me to Genesis 24. <clears throat> Genesis 24. You know the story very well. Abraham was looking for a wife for his son Isaac. He didn't want to, his son to get married to any heathen. So he calls his one of our trusted, beloved servant and says, go to my people, find a girl from them and then bring so that my son can marry. And this man goes, he reaches the place, he sits near a well and this is the prayer that he prayed. Such a weird prayer that I have never heard. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 24, verse 11, verse 12, verse 11 onwards, yeah. Are you with me? Genesis 24, verse 11 onwards. And he made his camels kneel down outside the city by a well of water at evening time. The time when women go out to draw water. Verse 12. Then he said, Lord God of my master Abraham, please give me success this day and show kindness to me by my, by, to my master Abraham. Behold, here I stand by the well of water. And the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Now look at verse 14. Now let it be that the young woman... To whom I say, please let down your pitcher that I may drink water. And she says, drink. The next part is interesting. And I will also give you camels a drink. Let her be the one who have appointed for your servant Isaac. And by this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. What kind of prayer is that? You know what he's saying? Women are coming. I'm going to sit here. And I'll ask this woman, any woman, please give me some water to drink. She has to do two things. What is that? She has to give me a water to drink and by herself, she has to say, can I give water to your camels also? Then I will know that girl is the wife to my master's son. Look what it says. Next verse. Verse 15. And it happened before he had finished speaking that behold, Rebecca, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milka, wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with her pitcher to the shoulder on her shoulder. Now the young woman was very beautiful and to behold, a virgin, no man had known her. She went, listen to this, she went down to the well. It's not open the tap and fill it. The scripture says, she took the pot, went down into the well and what does it say? Fill the pitcher and came up. Next verse, 17. And as the servant ran to meet her and said, please let me drink a little water from your pitcher. So she said, drink my Lord. Then she quickly let her pitcher down to her hand and gave him a drink. That's verse 18, verse 19. When she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels also. For how long? For how long? 
you're not looking in your Bible, until they have finished drinking. This man was now, his prayer is being answered. Now listen, how many camels did he come with? Some, verse 10, same chapter, verse 10. Somebody tell me, how many camels did he come with? Ten camels. What did Rebecca say? I will water all your camels until they finished drinking. Now look at this. How many liters of water does a camel drink? Research source, if a thirsty camel can drink up to 50 gallons of water. Typically, they'll drink around 30 gallons at a time. That is 150 to 200 liters of water. One camel. And this young girl, even without asking, she said to him, I will water all your camels until they are finished drinking. So 200 liters times 10, how many liters? 2,000 liters. You think she opened a tap and the water was running? What does the scripture say? There was a well, there was a pot. She has to get down into the well, bring the water and pour. To do 2,000 liters, how long it would have taken? I was imagining myself in that place. Moreover, he's a stranger. You come and sit there and you ask, Mohan, I'm so thirsty, can you give me some water to drink? Well, I'm a Christian, I'm a pastor, so I'll show some kindness. Yes, ma'am, okay. you can drink. Then after that, do you think I'll look at your camels and say, can I give water to your camels? No, I will not. And suppose he says, sir, I'm, I'm tired. Can you give some water to my camels? You know what I would say? Excuse me? Who do you think you are? First of all, I don't even know you. If you want water for your camels, you can borrow my pot, go down into the well, take the water and you pour yourself. I would have definitely said that. But as he asking water for drinking is first mile. She offering to water the, all the camels is the second mile. And while she was pouring water to all those camels, 10 camels, 2,000 liters of water, going in and coming out of the well, sweating, tired, one pot, the blessing was in the second mile. She never knew that by walking that second mile, she would find a life partner who is a patriarch in the Bible. If she refused, and said, sorry, sir, I have a work to go. My father is waiting for me. I have given you water. Be grateful and walked away. There won't be name of Rebecca in the Bible. The Holy Spirit waits for you, not in the first mile, but in the second mile. You, may, you can pray day and night in the first mile, but the Holy Spirit is saying, walk to the second mile. That's where my blessing is. She never even dreamt by pouring water to the camels her destiny is destined. You want to be blessed? Walk the second mile. If you get stuck in the first mile, do because it is a duty to be done, you are no receiving the blessing from the Lord. That's where the second blessing is. So that's a great tool of blessing. The fourth, ble the fourth benefit, it's a great way to build loving and lasting relationships. I'm saying this with a sad heart. Some of the highest divorce rates in the world is among Christians. We love God so much so that we can't even stay with one another. We love the Lord so much so that I can't even sleep with my wife or my husband. I love God so much so I come here and say praise the Lord, hallelujah, but I can't sit with a fellow member with whom I have some kind of a 24 years of experience I'm talking. If in relationship have to be perfect or loving, walk the second mile. You know what the biblical principle is, golden rule? Do unto others what you want them to do unto you. That's where the blessing is. If a wife and a husband 
their desire is to please one another the love will blossom children i was visiting one young man well educated good job 28 years old and i said man why are you not getting married you know what he told me pastor after what i have seen my mother do to my father i don't want to get married i don't want a girl in my life christian seventh day adventist i've seen people families whole week they fight and on the sabbath hand to hand happy sabbath come on a church we are a bunch of hypocrites and come here and say praise the lord hallelujah i don't know your scenario here families are disintegrating at a great rate relationships are being broken at a great rate this is what baffles me i love the lord so much so that i can't stay with a man or a woman of my own family please i plead with you walk that second mile love your spouse do more than what is expected of you and you see how much love it comes especially men i'm glad to see some men here come to england we hardly have men in the church i don't know where they go they just can't stay love your wife to the bits and she will give you her life that's my experience even if she is unwell she'll give herself to you when she knows that you love her to the bits practice second mile in your marriage in your relationships you will be the most happiest person finally the last benefit it's a great way to lighten your own burden it's amazing some of us when i become oh, when i when i earn some money when i get something when i have some savings that's uh, that's when i will help you let me tell you that day will never come if you don't know what to do with whatever the little you have now if you don't carry the burden of somebody else your burden own burden will not be light let me quickly tell you a story when i was training to be a pastor every summer i used to go for canvassing because we need to support ourselves we don't have anybody to support i told you i grew up in an orphanage we were to where to work so this summer i went i only had 150 rupees our money in india is called rupees that's almost like 2 dollars today i have to find a room i have to settle down and the room rent is 1500 rupees i only have 150 i don't know when i'm going to sell my first book so that i can get some money to eat as i got down in the railway station there was a gentleman who sat on one of the bench and he as i was passing by he called me and said please come here i went i'm so thirsty can you get me some water I said for sure so i took his bottle went to the tap filled it up gave it to him he said thank you and i was going excuse me can i ask you another favor I said yeah what is it he said i'm hungry i haven't eaten for the whole day somebody stole my purse my bag I don't belong here I don't even know the language he was talking to me in english can you help me i was so mad why i myself don't have money i only have 150 and i was cursing god lord after all these people walking by why does them have to call me i told him sorry sir i don't have much money i am also new to this place and i was walking back every step i took i was pain you're training to be a pastor somebody is hungry can't you even feed him that's one side the other side if you feed him tomorrow you will sit on the same bench and you have to beg <laughs> so you choose what you want to do i said i don't want to beg i will go i almost went out of the station but something pulled me back so i took out my purse and to my amazement i was even mad there was only two notes 100 rupee 150 rupee i wish there was some change i could have given into him so i have to do one of this guess what i gave i gave the least because i don't want to help him in the first place so i gave him 50 rupees oh thank you so much i'll pay back i don't want your money leave me alone and i walked away and i was cursing god cursing myself why did i have to stop with 100 rupees what will i do so i went to the stay, uh, pastor's home and he said yeah welcome where do you want to stay i said i don't know how much money you have i don't have any money i said that man looked at me and so why do you here in that There's a church far away if you want you go stay there I'll give you for free 
And they said, thank you. I went to the church. It's a very remote place. No electricity, no toilets, nothing. And I was wondering, all this while that man's face was coming, that man stole my money. He made me give up my money. And I slept that night. Next day, I went for canvassing. Whole day, I roamed. I couldn't sell a book. I have to eat. So I went to the cheapest hotel, bought little food, and I ate three meals. I spent 30 rupees, 10 rupees. The next day, second day, I couldn't sell a book. And the third day, I hardly have 10 rupees. And every day, I was cursing God and saying, why did you make this? Had I had that money, I would have survived another day. And on the third day, when I had no money, if I don't sell a book that day, there's no food. I don't even have money to go back home angry, upset with God and upset with me and that man's face was even making me feel miserable. So I went to a school and I went to sell and that man, principal invited me, okay, what do you have? I said this, I have that book, I have that book, I have that book. I have. Everything I have that man already bought from last year, somebody sold it. Sorry, I, I don't have to. I got so mad, I'm so hungry, what do I do? I thought, you should have told me before, why did you waste my time? I thought to my heart and I was walking by he said, by the way, where, do you, where are you staying? Who are you? I said, I'm a seventh day Adventist. I'm a student at Spicer College, training to be a pastor. Oh, where do you stay? I said, I stay in that village, in that church. Wow, that's not a good place. That's where terrorists are. That's where Naxalites are. I don't know if you know that name. That's where all these people. Are you not scared? I said, that's okay, God is there. But deep in heart, I'm not happy with God anyway. But God is there. You know that Adventist face we put up? He, was, he felt bad for me. He said, I have a room in my house. You can come and stay with me. I said, no, thank you, sir. If you buy book, that is enough for me. Okay, give me some books. He bought for 2,000 rupees. Every time he was giving money, I'm thinking of a beautiful hotel, good hotel where I can eat. And after that, he said, if you want, you can come and stay with me. I said, sir, no problem. Thank you, you bought the books. He said, no, I can't imagine you as a young boy staying in that place. He sent his servant in a car to pick up my luggage and took me to his home, a beautiful mansion, because he is the principal of that school. And I was thinking as being a pessimistic, I hope he won't ask me rent. If he asks me rent, then I'm done. Then I think he, he read my face and he said, sorry, don't worry, I won't ask you rent. So I was so glad I went. There was everything you need, luxurious flat, never stayed there. There's TV, there's refrigerator, there's telephone, everything, what? Because I never had such an opportunity. I cried out and said, Lord, thank you for blessing me. And that evening came, I was going to the hotel to eat. As I was going, passing by his house, he sent his servants and called that boy. Where are you going? I said, sir, I'm going to have my supper in a hotel. No, you're eating with me. Oh, so he fed me. And at the end of, how long you come to do this work? I said, two months. For the two months, you stay in that flat, free of cost, eat at my table, free of cost. I went back to my room. I cried and said, Lord, how foolish I was. Never realized that when you carry somebody's burden, you carry my burden. I walked that second mile that day knowing that I, I, I myself will be in struggle, not realizing. It is in giving that 50 rupees. The Lord had blessed me with more than 10,000 worth of rupees for a free of cost to me. I'm challenging you. Walk the second mile. Carry somebody's burden. Your own burdens will be lighted. That's biblical principle. That's where your blessing is. That's where your burdens will be lighted. The second mile never ends. Jesus never introduced a third mile. The second mile is a lifetime mile we are called to work. The second mile will always be under attack. People will not like you. People will not support you. It's lonely and it will be attacked. But yet, God calls you to walk that second mile. The second mile is a burdensome mile. Imagine carrying inconvenient, unreasonable, and yet God wants you to walk that second mile because that's where the Spirit of the Lord is waiting to bless you. The second mile is unreasonable. It is inconvenient. It is only traveled by few, very few, those who are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. There is no excuse for not walking second mile. You can't say, I am lame, I am dumb, I am deaf, I don't have money. Those things, no. Where there is a will, there is a way. You need to understand that. And also, who will not walk the second mile? The carnal. Those who are thinking of themselves, they struggle to walk. The complainers. There are people, always they're complaining. They always look at the negative side. 
they cannot walk. The jealous people cannot walk the second mile. Greedy people cannot walk because they think of themselves. Ever reckoning people, I, if I do this, what will you give me? Such kind of attitude people can never walk. Are there camels to be watered in your home? Are there camels to be watered at your job? At your church? In your friendships? In your neighborhood? Water them. You will see the blessing coming to you. Are you a first miler or a second miler? Let me say this. Regular church attendance is a first mile. If you come to church Sabbath after Sabbath, don't think you're doing any favor. It's the first mile. Why? Because you're expected to do it. If you're giving your tithe, sorry, if you tithing is a first mile. If you're a faithful tither, don't think you're gi giving a sacrifice. That's the first mile. As a Christian, you're expected to do. Bible study prayer meetings is a first mile. Telling others about the love of Jesus is a first mile because it's the duty of a Christian. Second mile is doing something that is not expected of you. That's where your real blessing is. The first mile is your duty. What does Romans 12:1 say? I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as what? A living sacrifice. And look at what it says, which is holy and acceptable to God, which is only what? A reasonable service. When you present yourself as a sacrifice to God, it is a first mile. Because the scripture says, it's a reasonable service. You're expected as a Christian to do it. And Jesus said, go the second mile, because that's where your real identity is. What is the second mile? It's a witnessing mile. It's a sacrificial mile. It's a commitment mile. It's a breakthrough mile. It's a sowing the seed mile. It's a deliverance mile. It's a birthing mile. It's a healing mile. The second mile is your destiny mile. Remember that. Jesus is the perfect example of a second miler. He doesn't have to come down. You know, Jesus is God. To save a human, how many steps downwards he took, you think? What do you consider higher than humans? Angels, yeah? Higher than angels? God. So for God to become a human, how many steps did he take downwards. Two, isn't it? He didn't become an angel. He, that's the first step. But he became a human. Can you imagine if you as a human see something that is lower than you, two steps lower than you, in trouble, and you want to go down to that level to save it, what would you become? What do you consider lower than you? Animals, yeah? Maybe a dog. That's the first step. What do you consider lower than a dog? Maybe an insect. Or an ant. So in other words, you see an ant in trouble, you want to save the ant, what do you do? You want to become an ant and go and fight with the hundred ants to save that one ant? I would rather use my foot to, uh, to uh, remove all the ants to save the ant I want. Do you want to become an ant? Become so vulnerable? Yet Jesus did it for you. Did for me. He took two, how long did he take the humanity for? Not just for 33 and a half years. He took it for eternity to identify himself with you for eternity as your brother. If Jesus could walk that second mile and if he taught you to walk the second mile, what stops you from walking that second mile? Because it is in that second mile Jesus is waiting for you. If you get stuck in that first mile, you will remain here and your destiny is hell. God bless each one of us that we become second milers, not first milers. God bless you all.